I wanna talk to you today about how to get out from being trapped in your head. And what do I mean by that? I think most of us in society are trapped in our minds and we're trapped in our thoughts and our thoughts get very, very repetitive and very, very dense and very, very useless. And this kind of ongoing density and uselessness of our thinking is always getting us to worry about things in the future that may not happen or be frustrated by the past. And it takes us out of the present moment. And what winds up happening is that when we live in our heads for too long, it actually gets it to where there's sort of a perversion or derangement in the mind. And a parasite actually forms in the mind that starts hijacking your consciousness and controlling you. So this is something that'll really, really mess up you having a conscious willpower because you're being run by that parasite. It messes with your discernment. You're not able to see reality correctly. And frankly, it even cuts you off from any kind of flow state because the place that we get our flow state is outside of our heads. And then as a result of that, you need all this validation and approval and dopamine spikes to feel any kind of flow state. So the whole thing is a mess. Now, how do you get out of it? Well, there's many, many different ways, but the one that I'm gonna be talking about in this video is the idea of how do you identify yourself? Now, Eckhart Tolle talks about this in The Power of Now at A New Earth, and I'd urge you to read those books. I've probably read them about 100 times each. So what I'm gonna be saying here is my own sort of take on Eckhart's work, and his work is, the take on things, is his take on the Tao Te Ching and the Bhagavad Gita and ancient spiritual texts. I also believe that the Bible actually really, really covers this, but just not as uh, overtly and as explicitly, but I believe that it is contained all throughout the Bible, but everybody would have their own opinion on that, and that's cool too. So do you identify yourself as the small me, as Eckhart Tolle would call it, or as the one consciousness and the one life force that animates everybody. Now that's sort of a weird question, right? Like, do you identify just as the body and as your ego and how you're against people and how you're under threat and how someday you're gonna die? Do you identify with that, which is you by the way, it's part of you, or do you primarily identify with that life force that animates you, that animates me, that animates everybody? Which do you identify with? Now, what you're gonna find is on a pragmatic level, like say paying your rent, <laughs> right? Paying your rent, or being on time for somebody who you're working with, or being a high performer. Obviously the fact that you're a separate person, the fact that life itself is filled with everything that steals energy from everything else. There's, uh, you know, in nature, the fish are all eating each other. In, in, on land, the animals are all killing each other. Historically, human beings, the main state has been war and death. So it's practical to say, no, I am my ego, I'm my body. That's a very, very practical concern, right? You don't want to be so passive that you're like, I am the life force that's in you too. Now kill me. And I'm never going to have any romantic relationships. I'm going to be broke, right? There's a difference there, right? So one of them is going too far. It's too extreme. But there's still a great benefit to identifying with that life force that's inside yourself. You know, identifying with the force of life. And what is that? What you'll find is that it actually draws the awareness out of your head. It draws it out of your head. And what winds up happening is that you reclaim a huge amount of mental capital. So see, when you're in your ego, most of your thoughts are being mad about the past, being worried about the future, being victimized, feeling like you're against people, being frustrated you're not getting approval, being frustrated you don't have control, feeling unsafe, looping on what's gonna happen, you don't know what it's gonna be, attacking yourself, feeling attached to things. Look at the sheer volume of mental capital that identifying with the ego is sucking up. It's insane. It's completely insane. And then when you add to that, that it becomes parasitic in your mind, there's a, basically what happens is that, and th this is kind of complex, and I, I could take about an hour to explain it. The short version of it is that if you're getting certain types of approval and reinforcement, this can actually become a flywheel in your mind where like a parasitic consciousness that sits atop your actual unfiltered consciousness, it actually forms there and it actually hijacks you, okay? And so you'll get it where, you know, somebody who identifies as a hustler, they work, 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 work all day, but then they, their, their perception actually alters so that they can't see easier ways of doing things. There's an easier way to do it, but their consciousness doesn't let them see it so that they can keep being a hustler. Somebody who feels like a victim, it alters, the parasite makes it where they can't even see areas where there are resources and where they're not victimized. And it becomes parasitic. Then it starts making fights with other people, starts burning down time, and that energy just runs like a flywheel, basically doing anything to hold itself there and not allow you to have unfiltered consciousness. So it winds up subsuming your will, it subsumes your discernment, and it winds up trapping you in your head, So, like I said, so that you can't get access to a transcendent state or to flow, and then it makes it where you need that approval or you need that control or you need to feel better than other people to even have access to a flow state. So now flow state becomes a little short dopamine spikes, becomes how you compare to other people. It's a mess, it's a mess, it's a mess, it's a mess. You're trapped in your mind. 
How are you ever gonna be world class with social skills? You're not at a bar club, out of your head, and not have to use alcohol when you're stuck like that, right? That's why so many people use alcohol, among other reasons. How are you ever gonna get it to where you're a world class public speaker? You wanna know what happens in public speaking? Come out to my one, one of my events. You might see four, five, six hundred people in the crowd. I don't even have a microphone on, I'm not even yelling, and just speaking almost like it's normal, like kind of like kind of yelling, but not really. My voice is booming out over 600 people without even speakers. I use speakers sometimes, I actually think it's good to use them, but I often don't, and I always turn them off at some point and show people. Why does my voice boom like that? Why am I able to do improvisational speaking? Why was I able to invent many, many, many of the ideas in our community, and so on and so forth? How did I come up with so many of these marketing ideas, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That comes from getting out of your head. So what winds up happening is that when you care less about competing or being better than people or being trapped in your head, Ironically, when you stop competing, you win. So a lot of people that'll talk to you about being competitive or being better than other people and so on and so forth, they're so caught up in the story that's in the mind, they're not actually looking at the real tangible results of what would happen if they got out of their own way and got out of their head. How their public speaking would improve, their humor would improve, their social skills would improve, their inventiveness, creativity would improve, and they'd have massive, massive, and massive amounts of energy. So what happens is that there is a pragmatic side that if a tiger is gonna run up and kill you, you don't wanna say, the one life that animates me, animates the tiger, and my life continues. So eat me now, Mr. Tiger. It's not about that, okay? You can, it's basically having one foot in the physical and one foot in the spiritual or your core essence. And so what happens is that when you're looking at somebody, you, you, know, you, you look at them in the eye and you realize that they are a part of you, you are a part of them, there is a commonality there, and you know if they're being difficult, there's ways to dispense with that situation or defend yourself or whatever, whatever it is that you feel you need to do, and that's fine. But what you'll find is there's another paradigm that's happening here, okay? And the paradigm, basically what it winds up being related with is less effort. So in other words, maybe somebody insults you, but you don't shrink and take it so seriously and you kind of laugh it off and either A, you ignore it because you don't care about it, because you're not threatened by it, or B, what happens is that you make some little small joke back and then everybody laughs with your joke because they can see that you're unreactive, they can see that you're unthreatened. You see how that can happen? Or maybe, you know, let's say that you're stuck at, say, making a million bucks a year and you want to get to 10 million bucks a year, 20 million bucks a year, and you're like, I gotta hustle, 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 hustle. Maybe just relax a little bit. You know, you take a walk down here at the park and then you wind up meeting somebody who's a multimillionaire or a billionaire and you wind up just in a chill, easier way working with them together and you never would have met them if you're a stress basket, and you never would have met them if you're trapped in your head and feeling that loop of needing to grind yourself in the dirt so the parasitic consciousness can stay trapped on top of your head. So there's counter arguments for everything. I would definitely say that success is intentional. People don't get success by accident. And so you should always have a huge role in your own success. You should be aware of where you stand. You should be aware of like, you know, how you're stacking up to other people or things like that. So there's definitely a role there that makes sense and is something that you should absolutely be aware of. There's an important reality that's there. But realize that everything is always the next paradigm. So in other words, the lowest level paradigm is apathy. You're not doing anything. And from there you say, hey, success doesn't happen by accident. You have to be intentional about your success. Get mentors, which you should always do by the way. Get mentors, get around better people. You're being programmed by the people who you're around. Get programmed by better people. It's always by somebody. Start taking action. Take massive action. Fight the fear. Get competitive. Don't be passive. Don't just sit there, right? That's that first phase. That's like the liftoff. From there though, again, realize that you're probably creating all these weird parasites. Realize that you're probably making it harder than it has to be. Realize that your discernment is a mess. Realize that you can't even see reality correctly without having to make yourself better than everybody else to have confidence. Realize that you're doing that and then from that standpoint, there's a whole other paradigm where you actually think less, try less, and what winds up happening is that you kind of merge in the world. And you'll get it to where maybe you're out at a waterfall, and the water, and this will sound weird, but like, th I mean, this is very, very weird, but you, you will experience this in my opinion. It's like the waterfall is giving you energy. It's like the leaf is giving you energy. The cloud is giving you energy. The dirt is giving you energy. The sun, the joy, the connection with other people is giving you energy. And you don't need that to be better than anybody. You just love it for the joy of the dance. And you wanna add value to other people. And in the process of adding value to other people, you get around better and better people, and then they wanna add value back to you. And that is why some people live in a hell on earth, and some people live in a heaven on earth. Heaven or hell, while that can be a place that you could go after you die, can also be considered what it is that you live in in life. 
And that's why you can look at things like the Sermon on the Mount in the Bible and look at what it is that that's pointing towards and understand that. And that's the idea that you, you will not only, there's not only heaven and hell to deal with later, heaven and hell is now. <laughs> okay? And the hell could be one of apathy and non-action and laziness. The hell could be one of feeling against everybody and over-competitiveness and ego and the density and parasite of the mind. Or the heaven on earth can be getting out of that. And look, what you're going to find is if you actually follow through on what it is that I'm telling you, you're not only going to feel a lot more peace, you're probably going to feel oftentimes euphoric. And that euphoric energy is going to propel you to do things that you couldn't even imagine. It's going to propel you to brilliance. You couldn't imagine skill set that you couldn't imagine. It's the kind of thing that, you know, it's, it's that kind of like six rings championship winner type of thing that makes you the best while never even really wanting to declare that you're the best. Because you don't care and you actually even want other people to be the best. You don't care because you know there's enough for everybody and everyone's on their own journey. But of course, ironically, because you don't care, you wind up being the best. But that's not even the point. So just keep that in mind, okay? Just let that be in your head and say to yourself, what do you care about more? Laziness and apathy and being on autopilot and finding the easy way out and you know, just numbing yourself like a lot of people? Do you care about being in a grind state and being angry all the time and feeling like the world is just this evil place and then being the, the winner of that? Or is what you care about is getting and tapping into your natural flow, being very, very present in the moment and being in a euphoric loving state where energy is coming out of you and your motivation is coming from that. So that there, in my view, is the place to be. And once you've had a taste for it, like the average person that would hear this and disagree with it, it's because they just haven't experienced it. And you know, I, if I could just spend an hour with them in person, I could show them something different. This, it doesn't take rocket science to understand this. And you'll see, you know, maybe you'll work with me personally in my mentoring. Maybe you'll come to one of my live events and meet me in person. Or maybe you'll continue to get it from my videos. Or maybe you'll get it from elsewhere, like the Tao Te Ching or Eckhart Tolle or many other places. So, Go back and read these books. You know, I've read the Tao Te Ching so many times. I've read the Bible so many times. I've read Eckhart Tolle so many times. Keep coming back to those books that stand the test of time. Those classical books that when you read them, like if you look at certain parts of the Tao Te Ching, you almost start thinking like, why am I reading anything else? Why am I looking at the internet? Like it's all fiction. This is the core underlying reality. But then of course, I'm always gonna read the Dan Kennedys and Alex Ramosi is a great contemporary marketer and all these different people and learn how to crush it. And I'm gonna be looking about, you know, books on immune system and natural health, not get sick in 10 years, all that stuff. I love all that stuff too. I love all of it. Okay, that's the cool thing about having energy to spare. But like I said, this has been a video series I've been shooting of late on the topic of endless motivation, what it means to have massive, massive motivation, what it means to have a massive, massive amount of energy. And a lot of people look at me, they say, how are you like this? You know, this is just like this thing that you have. I don't have that. No, everybody has that. Everybody has access to what I'm talking about here. It is certainly, certainly not unique to me. In fact, it is the most universal thing and least special thing that exists. You just got to access it. So we just shot over from Multnomah Falls here to Tokati Falls, two of the most beautiful waterfalls in Oregon. And I'm going to expand further on this idea of what it is that I got from Eckhart Tolle's books, The Power of Now and A New Earth. So I want you to think of this example here and seeing this beautiful stream as an analogy for whether or not you're identifying with your core essence or whether or not you're identifying just with the body and the ego. Okay? Now, the way that I want you to think about it is that when you're identified with the stream, that is different from being identified with some little muck pond off to the side of the stream, right? Because imagine right now, there's, there's this beautiful stream and the water's relatively clear and it's moving. It's the, kind of, it's the kind of waterfall you might even want to jump into. I don't know about this particular waterfall. Every waterfall is different. It could have germs. But in general, flowing water, usually in most cases, is more beautiful and clear to jump into than some nasty festering swamp. But what happens is, is that when you have that little body of water off to the side, maybe there's like a little pit to the side, some of the water shoots over, some rain, whatever, is that that little pit that's not moving, that's separate from the flow, and it's its own special little pit, winds up getting festering rot, green slime, weird larvae, weird things growing in it. And look, that has its beauty too. Weird larvae and algae and things like that, that's part of life, fair enough. But what do you want to jump into? You want to just swallow a bunch of larvae, start choking, some green slime choking, or do you want to be in the beautiful river? Well, when we talk about this idea of being, of, of identifying with your core essence, that is you identifying with the whole, not having to be special 
at jumping off the side saying, I'm the biggest victim. I can't even see opportunities, just victim. I'm the biggest winner. I'm the biggest hustler and things like that and needing to find identification just in the body or just in the ego. Because again, like we talked about at Multnomah, just to repeat it, what happens is that when you find identification with just the ego or just the body is it creates perversions, it creates derangements. The algae that you see or the larvae in there that you see, while it is a legitimate form of life and part of the earth and, and beautiful in its own way, it actually is, it's life. You know, imagine you saw that on Mars, you'd be like, yay, right? But nonetheless, while that is legitimate, it's an analogy for what happens in the pollution of the mind. So do you have larvae and green slime in the mind or is the mind flowing? And it creates that derangement. And what happens is, is that that life that starts forming in there, that algae, that green stuff, it wants to take over. The ego wants to take over. And so the ego will make it where you can't see reality correctly anymore. Or identification with the body puts you in that fear state. What the ego or the body are meant to be, when you think of mind, body, soul, is they're meant to be indicator lights. So you don't identify with them as rutting you, but they're indicator lights. So you should listen to your ego. Your ego's there to say, hey, you're not getting approval. You're not measuring up to your competitors. Why don't you add more? Why, why don't you harmonize with your environment a little bit more? Why don't you be a little bit more of a leader? Why don't you add more value? Wake up. Maybe you should be mad. Maybe you should feel stupid right now. Why are you failing? The question is, is that a total mind identification where there's no space in between it? Or is it an indicator light saying, hey, wake up, right? Is it, is it a light on the car that you can choose to react to or not that may or may not be accurate? Or is it grabbing the wheel like Rah! like that and it's grabbing it so much it's spinning until you crash? You see the difference here? Is it an indicator light or total identification? Now, when you look at somebody, you're gonna be, if you, if you become attuned to this, you get savvy to it, you're going to be able to tell what is it that they're identified with. You will see with clear obviousness if they're identified with their core essence, with the soul, present energy, are they operating from that space? Are they identified with the ego? Or are they identified with the body? What are, they, what are they identified with? So somebody who's just very much in physical consciousness, you'd think that that would be awesome, right? But in many cases, they get super duper lazy, they take the path of least resistance, and there's not enough consciousness there to take the steering wheel and lead it in the right direction. And very, very much a fear state and primitive. Again, cool indicator lights. Maybe you need a break. Maybe you should be more safe. Let's not deny the body and view it as evil, it just shouldn't be the person at the steering wheel, that's all. It's like an airplane. You know, do you want like some weird, you know, mechanation in the wing just running randomly or do you want the cockpit running it, right? So, you know, the, the, the pilot running it. What do you want? It's not a bad thing. It's, 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 it's your, your body is meant to be there in support of your consciousness. But what happens when your consciousness is just this vague little thing almost snuffed out and your body's running amok? Likewise with the ego, you will see somebody in ego consciousness. You'll see it where what they're doing, you're gonna, you're gonna tangibly observe this. One thing in ego consciousness is it relies on separateness. So you'll see them saying things like, I got a diamond watch. Or they'll say things like, I'm the best, I'm the top, I'm the man, you know, things like that. Now that's fun as a way to break out of the laziness consciousness of the body. So you don't say that you're very, very lazy. You say, no, 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 I got my ego, I'm the man. You see what's going on there? That's an upgrade. That's a step in the right direction. It's very rare that some derpy person who's being run by their physical consciousness just steps into total presence or enlightenment. is bizarre, never gonna happen. So the ego actually serves a function as like spinning the initial propeller and getting lift off. The ego can create lift off. The ego is you, you know, in levels of energy or uh, power versus force. It's like that point where maybe in the lowest states you're depressed or have shame or apathy. And all of a sudden you start getting angry. You start getting the will, right? That's when the ego starts activating. I want you to think of the ego in, in essence as like, a little bit like say, if you had a, if you had a, a, a computer or a phone, some kind of like computer device, and it, and it has like a base level operating system, because when you're born, your body doesn't know that you might cultivate your own operating system and curate it and consciously cultivate it. So the ego is like, the, and, and the physical intelligence are kind of like these baseline level intelligence, you know, to where if you fail to ever curate your own real highly functioning intelligence of the soul, then at least there's that. Okay, but to wake up and to have that second birth, what you've got to do is you've got to stop just being stuck there. Okay, because you'll see someone stuck in their ego to where they get dopamine from feeling better than others. So you'll see what they're doing where they're saying, oh, that person sucks, I'm the best. And 
it's one thing if that person's doing it and it's like kind of funny and, and I think there's incredible humor in that. Like I even had my son Dylan going through a seminar saying, I'm the man, I'm 10. You gotta listen to me, I'm 10. Right, and it was hilarious. I like stuff like that. I find comedy in that. It's not like if I see someone in their ego, I'm like, oh, nyo, 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 and shaming them. I think egoic comedy is hilarious. In fact, some of the best comedy is kind of letting our ego kind of run amok and it's kind of funny to let it run amok because it sort of lets it out and let, lets it play a little bit. It's hilarious. So it's not about shaming somebody for being maybe a little lazy. Like, isn't it kind of funny to just imagine yourself just sitting there like, you know, eating some Cheetos with your crusty keyboard? That's comedy. You know, I'm the man, right? That's comedy. There's humor in that. Some of my favorite uh, teachers and speakers do that. You know, even ones that are rich. I love these guys because they're funny. But there's a difference between something being funny and it being real. Like, I think Cardi B is funny, but I've dated people who thought Cardi B was like Tony Robbins and they're doing coke and they're driving around on a rampage listening to Cardi B like it's real. So you've got to be able to make the distinction between is this comedy and kind of fun and kind of firing you up and, and like a kind of a cool dialogue to fire you up and to, and to snap you into it and make you stop being a wimp and lazy and to get you to take action? Or is this like what you view as like mature adulthood and where you're really trying to go and something that would lend to you having any base level core essence. Because if you let that run too long, in effect what happens is that while it's funny initially, um, it creates such a loss of discernment, it creates its own parasitic consciousness, gets filled with algae, gets filled with larvae, and takes you away from who you are. So Bruce Lee talks about this in the idea of Jeet Kune Do, and what he says is, be like water, my friend, right? He's jacking this from the Tao Te Ching, who isn't, I am too, read the Tao Te Ching. It's the idea of connecting the natural energy of life, connecting the flow of life, the power of non-action, read all this, you gotta understand it, Eckhart Tolle is the entry point, then go to the Tao Te Ching, Bhagavad Gita, go in the Gospels, these things will build on your knowledge of this. Very, very powerful. But the idea being, he says that, and he says, in martial arts, don't be attached egoically to a method. Take that which works, discard that which does not, and create something truly your own. Be like Watson, my friend. Bruce Lee says this. Learn from Bruce Lee. Get the general idea of it. And when you do, what you'll find is, what he's saying, is that you get, an, you get a power. Like Bruce Lee, by being in that kind of Tao state, being connected to Tao, could throw a harder punch. Maybe you're doing public speaking, your voice is booming. Maybe you hit up a bar or club and you meet everybody effortlessly and it doesn't run you down. Maybe you're making creative business ideas. Maybe because your body is brimming with euphoria 80, 90% of the time or a huge amount of the time, what's happening is you feel so good, everybody's getting run down, they're, they're coughing and choking and snot coming out and you're around them. Maybe even your significant other has that and nothing happens to you for decades at a time. Perhaps I could have, a, I don't know, just something that I've seen personally, but that's an anecdote and I'm not giving you advice. So you see the idea of what I'm talking about here, okay? It's just, can you tap in? And what happens is, you feel that by being separate that you're more, but in fact you're less. Because you lack discernment, you lack access to your own state of flow, you let, you're not connected to your own will, and what happens, uh, most importantly, is that just to function, you're needing to place everyone below you all the time. I've seen people that, that are so damaged and so wounded and so disconnected from flow, that they need to talk about people who they think that they're better than every three to four minutes. And then, they, they, and then it makes them laugh and energizes them. That's what happens when you're that disconnected. Imagine how warped and perversion and a derangement of the mind it is to live there. It's funny as a joke. I can find comedy in that. I don't, I don't take it serious. But if you're living there for real, that, like, that's not a joke. That is crazy. So this is basically some of the ideas that I took from Eckhart Tolle. I wanted some of these ideas that I'm sharing here to be about, you know, like it, when I was about 26, I had some experiences where, my, where the thinking in my brain would just shut off. And, and I'd feel so, so good, it was so, so crazy. So idea being that these are ideas that I took back when I was 26. And I had this weird experience of total presence for a couple days. Some people call that a Satori experience, where I actually found out what my essence was. And I realized that my entire life, I was spending building this character that wasn't even me. And that the more that I was getting love for that character, the more that that character was being loved, the more that it was actually disconnecting me from real love. It was building the ego while starving the self-esteem. And when I had that experience, and I found out what it meant to truly be in flow, what happened was I had to reconsider everything. Why am I doing what I'm doing? What is motivating me? What do I want to do for a career? Everything had to be reconsidered. It's like a chick popping out of an egg and rethinking everything. Imagine what life would be like if you just felt a present state of euphoria and felt a desire to just take a ton of action and wanted to do things with your life but to act from there. And many of the egoic drives that you had, like, you know, create, create the farm with the, with the steroid cows. I said, no, I wanna create something in balance. It's not about me, it's not about my ego, it's not about 
such excess that it's a cancer, like a little small cell that, that believes, that's what cancer is, right? It's, it's, a, it's a cell that doesn't just want to be a part of the body. It wants to multiply, 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 and it kills the body. Right? Understand that even death itself and being, and, and being identified with the ego, which makes you less afraid of death, doesn't mean you're not afraid of death. Certainly not. You'll, the last moments, you can freak out, to be honest. It's human. Right? Maybe the essence goes out before the body does and your, and your body freaks out. But the idea that you are not as afraid of death, right? What, what we're moving towards in our society is where they're saying, you know, maybe someday you don't have to die. Maybe you upload your brain into, into the cloud or things like that. But what would that ultimately do is maybe preserve the thoughts of the ego, but snuff out your soul. And that's why that energy and that paradigm and that consciousness is moving us towards that. And so ironically, people that don't go in the cloud will be viewed as some kind of weird death cult. But in fact, the death cult is the cloud itself. It's okay that you're going to die someday. It's okay that this is a brief moment. It's okay that the body's not forever. It's okay that the ego is not forever. They're indicator lights. They're valuable. Value them. They're beautiful. They motivate you. Great. Amazing. But when you connect at that core essence, you move into that flow, just like that energy is moving now, that will be you. You will have endless motivation. You'll be so fired up. People will look at you almost like in a supernatural light. It's beautiful. This is what I took from Eckhart Tolle. Because what happened was after those four or five days of being in that state, I think it was four days, I went in a very, very dark space. My ego reactivated and it was like I was just physically retching and sick for several days because I couldn't maintain that energy level for that long. But I wanted to know what had happened to me and I had a memory of being in that state. So I went in and I, and I was like, well, what have I seen? And I'd seen Eckhart Tolle and he looked like this very slow speaking person and like this old derpy guy in a vest and exactly like the opposite of what I wanted because I want to have swagger, confidence and so on and so forth, money. So seeing Eckhart, he talks very slowly, but I later learned that part of why he spoke more slowly is he's leaving gaps in what he's saying. And the gaps is where you reconnect with presence. You're not in a rush. You're moving, but not in a rush. And so in many ways, what it's like, it's like a sailboat. The ego and the body is like doing this, but the essence is when you throw up that sail and you're still moving the rudder. You're not just doing nothing. You're moving the rudder, but you're letting it power you through. Maybe sometimes you still break out the oars too. That's what they're there for. It's an indicator light, but it's not who you are. So hope this helps you a lot and hope that you've enjoyed these two beautiful waterfalls. I think it's the most beautiful in the world. I come out here to rejuvenate and recharge myself and I like to bring you as a part of the journey. Think about what it would mean to get present to the moment, to get connected to your ego, to operate from there. Be back with a lot more soon. I love you very much. Peace.